those of you who are still here, I just put up the presentation for tonight. Um, the presentation schedule for tonight, I should say. Our next presentation starts at 4.30. It's Eva Othill, and she'll be going over the juvenile justice system in Connecticut. It's Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to my capstone presentation. So um, this year, I did a capstone presentation on juvenile justice in Connecticut, specifically um, juvenile justice reform in Connecticut this year. Um, so just a general overview of my project. Um, so I mainly looked at the 2020 recommendations made by the Juvenile Justice Policy and Oversight Committee. Um, and I focused on two of those recommendations. So um, raising the minimum age and education in the juvenile justice system. Um, as well as um, since these um, recommendations were never able to pass through the Connecticut legislature due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I decided to give a little bit of a background on the COVID-19 response in the juvenile justice system, um, along with distance learning in detention centers. Um, so what is the Juvenile Justice Policy and Oversight Committee? So it was formed in 2014 and it was tasked with evaluating policies surrounding the juvenile justice system and expanding the um, jurisdiction of juvenile court to include 16 and 17 year olds. So it is staffed and run by the Tal Youth Justice Institute at University of New Haven. And it's staffed with um, state and local representatives, community members, and members of the Tally Justice Institute. Um, so it's a really diverse group of people who can bring their ideas and their exper experiences um, to the table to help improve um, the juvenile justice system in Connecticut. So they have a four goal plan for um, 2019 to 2021. So it includes limiting entry into the system, reducing incarceration, um, reducing racial and ethnic disparities in the system, um, and setting appropriate upper and lower age limits. So some accomplishments that they have made are that Connecticut has been, has become known um, to be one of the states with one of the lowest incarceration rates of youth. Um, and right now it is the lowest incarceration rate to date in Connecticut. Um, and this is because they have a large focus on diverting youth um, away from the system and away from detention centers, um, as well as other states. Um, for example, I know Massachusetts um, are trying to replicate something similar to the JGPOC in order to um, accomplish similar things that we have accomplished in Connecticut. Um, so I'm just gonna go over a quick overview of all of the recommendations made by each of the work groups. Um, and then I'm going to go deeper into the minimum age and the education in the juvenile justice system. So the diversion work group um, recommends that the minimum age be raised from seven years to 12 years of age, a um, implementation of community-based diversion system, um, development and implementation of a statewide database system, which would include tracking, monitoring, um, evaluating and case management. The Education Committee um, recommends that an implementation team um, be established so that it can assist with the development of a plan to create a DCF administrative body, administrative body um, which would, this body would provide oversight for all education for all juveniles in out of home placements. Um, so this team would include um, state, local representatives, um, members of the education committee and members of the JJPOC. So this team would be used to identify a timeline for creation, funding, and anything else that may be necessary in order to establish um, the oversight of all the educational services. The incarceration work group recommends that the laws on juvenile transfer be amended. So um, this is to reduce population of youth in the adult system. Um, so A felonies, which are more serious crimes, um, would remain an automatic transfer. B felonies um, would no longer be an automatic transfer um, and they would receive a discretionary hearing to determine if they should be transferred to adult court or stay in juvenile court. And then C, D, and E felonies um, would be completely removed from transfer so they cannot be transferred to adult court. Um, they would also implement a second look provision for all youth. So this is a second look at their sentencing. Um, so it's a sentence review within 50% of their sentence or at their 18th birthday, whichever comes first. And this is used to determine if continuation of incarceration is needed for that youth. The incarceration group also recommends that um, 
the state eliminates the need for petition and automatically erases juvenile records after the existing two-year period. So as of right now, if you have a juvenile record in the state of Connecticut after two years, you can petition to have it erased, um, but they're recommending that it just be automatically erased. Um, unless it is a serious juvenile offense, then it would still need to be petitioned to be erased. Um, and they recommended that July 1st, 2020, um, that all telephone and telecommunication services would be provided free of charge for all youth. So the community expertise work group, which is just a group of, it's a group of community members who either have for, first or second hand justice invo involvement in the justice system. Um, so they bring their knowledge and input or feedback on policy or legislation. So um, they would like to increase the membership of JJPOC by two community members and two youth. So these, again, are people who have first or second hand justice involvement, and um, they would also need funding for stipends, transport, and child care so that these members um, would be able to regularly and consistently attend the JJPOC meetings. Um, so now I'm going to get, go into a little bit more about raising the minimum age. So currently in the state of Connecticut, the minimum age of juvenile court jurisdiction is seven years old and the JJPOC recommends that the minimum age be raised to 12 years of age. So um, the diversion work group is going to create a plan to, revert, to refer children to diversionary programs rather than juvenile court. Um, so children under the age of 12 would be referred to diversionary programs um, when before they would have been referred to juvenile court. So um, diversion programs can include mental health services, uh, behavioral health services, um, and they can include the family and the community um, to have a positive impact on the child. So some of these programs include, but are not limited to, um, community-based diversion system, the community-based services, um, and the children's behavioral health system. So this plan um, is just going to outline a referral process um, which would provide developmentally appropriate services for each youth, um, such as screening, assessment, and intervention. So why is it important that we raise the minimum age? Um, so one thing I did look at is, can a seven to 12 year old really understand the legal proceedings that they would go through if they were, were referred to juvenile court? Um, so a seven-year-old can be in a like first or second grade and a 12-year-old can be in sixth or seventh grade. So that, that is a big gap of knowledge, but it is also somebody in sixth or seventh grade probably is not going to understand legal proceedings and neither is a seven-year-old. So that is something that I looked at and I also looked at um, things that the court takes into consideration when determining competency. So um, this is the ability to receive a fair trial. So the defendant needs to understand the consequences of their charges, the trial process, and their rights in the process. Um, they also need to be able to participate in developing and presenting a defense, and they also need to be able to make decisions about when to exercise and or waive rights. Um, so it's also important to look at how a seven-year-old probably wouldn't understand much of this, neither would a 12-year-old. Um, so it's understand, it's, um, it needs to be understood that um, it's hard for a child to, un to receive a fair trial. Um, it's also important to look at the fact that detention centers don't always have a positive impact on the child. So that's why programs that give interventions, therapy, mental health services should be provided to aid the child and help them um, understand their actions, the consequences of their actions and things like that. Um, so this is just a um, graph um, about the referrals by age out of fence. Um, for court referrals in the state of Connecticut. So as you can see, in 2010, there were 350 youth underneath, under the age of 12 that were referred to juvenile court. And in 2019, last year, there were 125 youth. So that's more than a 50% drop. Um, so the 125 youth of last year, that's a very small number and it most likely will decrease um, this year. So that's a very small number to refer to court. So it would be um, more beneficial to refer them to um, diversionary programs. So the next thing I'm gonna um, share is education in the juvenile justice system. Um, so currently the children cycle through multiple providers. Um, and so the JJP, OC recommends that um, a committee be made that's going to form a coherent system that's going to oversee all education at all stages of out-of-home placement. 
Um, so with that, there does need to be um, quality control. There does need to be transitional support um, to and from their home school district. Um, there needs to be a customized curriculum and specialized teacher training um, because these children are usually the children who have more educational and social needs. Um, and the education for the youth who are incarcerated um, must be at the same level and held to the same standard as public schools in the state of Connecticut, um, as well as funding is needed because it, it costs around $35,000 a year for a child in the juvenile justice system to um, be educated. So funding is needed to provide all of these services. So this is a clear depiction of the educational path of a youth in the juvenile justice system. Um, so as you can see, there's four different providers um, in every single, for all the stages, there's four different providers of education. So for example, if I was a 15 year old, I would go from my home school district um, of Guilford and I would be moved to detention at either Bridgeport or Hartford Correctional. Um, and I would be under the jurisdiction of either Bridgeport or Hartford Board of Education. Um, and then once I enter secure custody, it would either be detention, judicial, or United States District 1, which um, that is at Manson Youth Institute or York Correctional Institute. Um, so those are also different providers. And then when entering a community residential facility, the State Department of Education is going to approve a private special education program. So that is once again a different um, educational provider. And then once if I would be put on probation, then um, I would return back to Guilford Public Schools. So as you can see, it's a very fragmented process. Um, and it's also important to note that this process can happen over different lengths of time, but it is important to note that if a child is only in the system for about three months, they're only spending a few weeks in each of these um, parts. So it's not going to have much of an impact on them and it's not going to be very beneficial to that youth. So um, it's important to have a coherent school system so that um, there can be quality control. So you need to be able to track outcomes so that um, you can um, see what is working, what is not working, where are children succeeding, where are they not succeeding, why are they not succeeding, or why are they succeeding, and make um, proper adjustments. And you also need to make sure that youth are aware of their credit and their performance, just as much as maybe their advisor or counselor is, um, because it's important that that youth stay engaged and they need to know if, what credits they're completing and what credits they may need to complete so that they can be engaged, engaged in their educational process. Um, because it is, it's crucial that it's a positive educational experience for them so that they can get the most out of it, um, because often these kids probably don't haven't had um, positive educational experiences in the past. Um, it's also important that um, this school district is an accredited institution um, to make it easier to transfer credits um, because you want the credits to transfer back to the home district of the child um, to ensure that they can graduate and re or receive their degree on time um, because, oh, sorry. Um, because you wanna make sure that the youth isn't becoming frustrated with the educational process and feeling hopeless in the educational process because you want to feel, you want them to feel like they're succeeding and that this process is an important one rather than um, just a task that they have to complete, something that's not enjoyable or something that they feel like they will never be able to complete. Um, it's also important to meet the social and educational needs um, of the child. So this means specialized professional development for teachers because um, these youth need more um, social and educational needs than maybe a child in a normal public school district such as Guilford would need. So it's important that the teachers are able to cater to um, that youth's um, specific needs. And again, engaging youth is a very important part of it. Um, as well as the transition um, from and back to local school district, that should be a seamless process. So that should include the institutions communicating, um, the counselors communicating, um, credits need to be able to transfer, um, and the youth should also be included in this process. So they should be included in what credits are transferring, what is it going to look like when I go back to my school district, um, what classes am, am I going to be taking, um, am I going to get to take classes that I want to take, so things like that, which again goes along with the engagement part of it. Um, so now I'm just going to give a little overview of the COVID-19 response to um, what has been happening in the, in the detention centers. So 
there are no visitors allowed into the facilities um, and they are trying to reduce the number of children in detention centers. So that's looking at it on a case by case basis and seeing which children can be released to maybe community programs or foster care back to their families. And um, at the end of March, Hartford detention, they stopped um, admissions. So um, obviously employees are going in and out of the detention center and they're interacting with people outside of the detention center. So it's important that they're screened every day. So they get temperature checks um, and they get questions about symptoms um, and tests are available if they do have symptoms and if they do feel the need to get tested. Um, they have also improved sanitation in detention centers. So they've been using the um, machines that they fog the room or the hallway, um, which would um, kind of sanitize just everything around it. And they've been using other protective measures. Um, and so meeting with probation officers, those are all done over the phone to limit contact. Um, and masks, just like anywhere else in the state of Connecticut, are required when you are out and about um, or interacting with other people. And um, that's a very important part of it. Um, and then testing is only done if youth are symptomatic. So when they first, if they are admitted to a detention center, um, they are quarantined for 14 days. So um, there has been conversation about, well, is this going to be detrimental to the youth's mental health or because you're limiting social interaction, how is that affecting the youth? So it obviously anybody you're um, socially isolating for 14 days, that is going to affect them. So they have been taking extra measures to make sure that um, the youth are being interacted with on a daily basis, um, whether that be with the therapists or um, the JBOs or um, nurses, just to make sure that they do have some social interaction. But unfortunately, per CDC guidelines, they do need to be quarantined for 14 days. Um, and then I'm just going to go into a little bit about um, distance learning. So the distance learning that I do at Guilford is very different from the distance learning that they are doing in detention centers. Um, so in Bridgeport, they're given packets and then the packets are graded and um, they're given credit um, based off of the results. Um, and in Hartford, they do meet with teachers occasionally, they do receive packets and they are exploring the use of virtual classrooms because they have been able to limit in both detention centers, the number of children down to I think about 10 to 12 kids in each center. Um, so it's important to note that even though these kids are the ones who may need, who have higher um, educational needs, they aren't necessarily having those needs met just because um, it is very difficult to do. Um, so throughout my project, I've learned that these reforms are crucial to improving the juvenile justice system in Connecticut. Um, but I've also learned that the entire system as a whole has a lot of problems and does need to be reformed. And when a lot of people um, think about the criminal justice system, they think about police. So it's important to note that there are a lot of different layers to the justice system. And in today's world and with the current events going on today, it is important to acknowledge that there are racial and ethnic disparities and it does disproportionately affect um, minority communities. So it's important that people recognize that there needs to be reform done not just in policing, but at every single level of the justice system in order to um, in order for the justice system to function in a way where it serves everybody um, in an equal manner. So um, that is something that I have learned and I um, urge you to go and educate yourself about things like this and be a part of the change to um, help improve our justice system. So thank you. Nice job, Eva. If you want to um, stop sharing your screen, you can come back on and we'll open it up to questions. So for everyone tuning in, if you want to use the chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can make comments, you can ask questions, and I will read those aloud to you. Nice job tonight. Thank you. I think Ella Petra said yes, Eva. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ellie. Uh, William Carbone said, bravo. <laughs> Della said, nice job. <laughs> Lots of good jobs. Um, okay, here's a question. Um, from Liza Catino, do you know when these recommendations will go into appropriate state congregational committee or voted on? 
Um, so they were supposed to be voted on and go through the Connecticut legislature this year, um, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the legislature kind of shut down for a while and they weren't um, prioritized. So hopefully within the next year, they um, can go through the Connecticut legislature um, and become laws. Do you think um, the COVID and the coronavirus kind of halted a lot of that and made it sort of difficult? Yeah, yeah, it definitely did because, um, especially because it's really hard to make changes when you're constantly changing um, the health needs of people and that's constantly changing and the restrictions are constantly changing. So that's very difficult. Sure, absolutely. Um, so we have a question here. Why do you see this as important given what's happening right now in our country? Um, well, given what's happening in our country, um, I think it's very important for everybody to acknowledge that um, the justice system disproportionately affects minority communities. So it's very important to notice that um, a lot of people are calling for reform um, for policing, um, but it's important to notice that um, when somebody enters a justice system, especially juveniles, that they're given what they need and that um, it's not disproportionately affecting people based off of their race um, or their socioeconomic status. So it's important to educate yourself about this and to um, vote um, because voting um, state, local representatives um, for Senate or Congress or for president, those are all crucial things to um, changing our system and changing it for the better. Good answer. Okay, we have another question here. I noticed there were no parents involved in your bulleted points. Does the system try to keep parents informed? Um, yes, yeah, so part of um, diversion programs and restorative justice is including families in it. So um, especially for youth, it's important to include families in the process. And it's important that the youth is consistently, if they are in a detention center, having interactions with their family. Um, and it's also important that families understand um, the different um, processes, uh, processes of um, going through the justice system. Sure. Uh, very interesting, informational and timely. Is this something that you're interested in pursuing after high school? Um, yes, so I am attending Michigan State University next year um, and I'm majoring in criminal justice with a minor in law justice and policy and I specifically chose Michigan State because they have a very good criminal justice system, uh, school and um, I really liked a lot of their electives um, that focused on juvenile justice and they also had a lot of really cool opportunities to um, go to different cities within the United States. Um, to do different internships and work with different programs, so. And you certainly have an upper hand going into that, having this experience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is from Shannon Clarkson. Do you think it is better to place children in adult prisons, Manson or York, or is the special facility, or in a special facility for youth? Um, I think that we should try to avoid um, transferring youth to adult prisons as much as possible because adult prisons don't have the resources that youth prisons do to catering to youth's needs like education, um, social, mental, behavioral, um, because the youth system is built to cater to youth's needs and the adult system is built to cater to adults' needs. So I think that it is important that um, youth stay in the youth system so that they can um, be provided with all those services. Good answer, makes sense. My last question, um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with your mentor, um, how that kind of shaped your project? And I think I remember reading that you attended one of the, one of the JJPOC meetings. Um, and can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I, I would like to thank my mentor, Erica. Um, I believe she's on the call right now um, for providing me with all of the research I needed and all the information surrounding the JJPOC. Um, so, yeah, I, I went to the meeting in, I believe, January, where they were voting on the recommendations and making amendments to the recommendations. Um, so that was a really cool process to see just because they, um, 
they would uh, like read the recommendation and um, different members of the JJPOSB would speak up. So whether that would be like a community member or a state representative about what they felt would be important to include or take out. Um, and then they would vote on it where everybody, where someone, everybody in the um, room would either say I or no, um, depending on what they thought. So that was a really cool experience to see. And I also, I watched all of them on CTN network, so. Awesome. Um, another question here from Anne. Is there anything that surprised you during your research, good or bad? Yeah, so actually the minimum age um, surprised me that it was seven years old because to me that's very young. I'm a, I'm a math tutor. Um, so I tutor kids from the age of six all the way to the age of 19, but I mostly tutor younger kids. Um, so that was shocking to see that like kids that young could enter into the justice, into the juvenile justice system. Um, so I wasn't originally going to focus on that, but once I learned more about that and did more research on it, I thought um, that that was something that was important that people should be informed about. And you said the legislation is trying to change that to 12, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you think the likelihood of that is? I hope high. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Maria Jennings, what was your favorite part of this project? Um, my favorite part was being able to kind of just look at all the different processes um, that go into um, reform and um, different policies um, because um, that is something that I'm interested in doing in the future. So um, it has also um, sparked my interest in um, juvenile justice um, rather than just criminal justice as a whole. So I would like to in the future um, maybe work with something that works on um, policies for juveniles and things like that and reforming the system. Well, I think we can all say that we're so happy that you're going to be continuing your work at Michigan with this because you clearly have a knack for it and a passion for it. So Thank really you. well Thank done job tonight. Really Thank impressive. You. you should be proud. Thank you. Um, thank you for also setting this up and making sure that we can present in a semi-normal way um, without being able to do the normal presentation. So thank oh, you. You're welcome. That means a lot. And thank you everyone who tuned in.